This is Gerardo Del Real with Outsider Club. Joining me today is President and CEO of First Cobalt, Mr. Trent Mill. Trent, how are you this afternoon? Hey, Gerardo, very well, and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well. Now, the last time we spoke, and this is a while back, this was August of last year, you said that the goal of the company, you, you uh, let me provide some context here. You had just announced the merger. You, 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 you were merging to become the go-to exploration cobalt company in the space. You said you wanted scale, you wanted liquidity, and you wanted the expertise of the three companies coming together. And I have to say, since the last time we've spoken, and I just touched on this privately off the air, you've done an absolutely brilliant job executing. So let me start by congratulating you. And then let me ask you how you feel right now now that you've traded, that you've seen the run-up in the share price, and, and frankly, you've consolidated some of the, some of the, some of the premier land um, in North America. Well, first off, thank you, Gerardo, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say right out of the gate, these are always team efforts, and, and there is a big team here. Um, I'm just the, the cheerleader, head cheerleader, I suppose, but the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the goal of that three-way merger that we announced over the summer was yeah, to consolidate the camp and, and to get scale. And so coming out of that transaction, we expected to have a minimum market cap in, in Canadian dollars of about 150. Uh, as we sit here today, early January, we're, we're just north of 300, probably closer to 330 million in market cap. So the market response has been good and it's driven, it's three things. It's, it's the land package that we've managed to pull together in a near town called coincidentally Cobalt, Ontario. Um, it's, it's the team we've got, all of us. I mean, management alone has got over 100 years of mining experience. Our board's got another 150 or so. So these are people that are not promoters. We've all been involved around the world in exploring, developing, and operating assets. Um, and, and the last is just the market. I mean, the market for Cobalt is, is red hot. There's a, there's a dearth of opportunities outside the Congo. EV projections just keep going up. And uh, on the buy side, whether you're a retailer or a big institutional fund, it's really hard to get exposure to a, you know, a large, liquid, credible cobalt story. And, and I think we uh, we delivered on that objective. And, you know, the pressure, how I feel right now, the pressure is on us now to execute. Last year was really about laying the foundation, putting the company together. We now sit here with uh, what I would argue is the best land, prospective land position, uh, and certainly North America, if not, uh, if not the world and uh, 30 million in the bank. So there's going to be a lot of activity at a first cobalt in the year ahead as we get busy drilling and and doing other prospecting activities, uh, not just in our camp, but also beyond. Well, that cobalt, that historic Canadian cobalt camp was actually a silver camp at one point, wasn't it? That's correct. It was in the 1920s. It was arguably the world's largest silver camp. And, And what we have going through the archives 110 years later, 50 years really since any meaningful activity has taken place, uh, what we've identified is the, the the so-called failed silver mines invariably had more cobalt than they had silver. And so you've got these carbonate veins. They were just mining these things as narrow underground deposits. Uh, they would typically mine these veins where they were rich in silver. Uh, and, and when they were getting into zones that were higher in cobalt content, they would they would basically wither away. And people didn't, didn't mine for that really in that era. So still produced 50 million pounds of cobalt historically, but 600 million ounces of silver. That was the focus. We're going back now with, you know, kind of three different approaches. One is we're looking for the cobalt content that, that was ignored in the past. Uh, second, we're looking for big bulk mining opportunities, not narrow vein, but, you know, bigger bigger mines that you would see in the current era. And thirdly, this acquisition, this three-way merger and all the work we did last year allowed us to consolidate almost half the camp. So you can start wow. to look at regional formations and structures and opportunities, whereas before everybody had this tiny little postage size claim that didn't allow them to take the broader, a broader view of the camp. Now, you're not looking for cobalt over moose pasture. You're actually looking in an area that's got over 100 yeah. past producers throughout. And that's an important point to make, Trent. Can, can you talk about that a bit? Because that's incredible. Sure. And if you want to look from open pit perspectives uh, near us, we've got uh, the Canadian Malartic mine that was uh, built a, year, a decade or so ago by Cisco Mining. Shortly thereafter, Detour Lake by Detour Gold. These are these were two operations that are you know, massive open pit operations that were basically you know, rediscovered uh, on, 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 uh, over, under, and around old underground mine workings. And so we're taking that same approach into the cobalt camp. I did it myself with a company called Falco on an underground deposit called the Horn Mine, where the Naranda Mining Company uh, was effectively born. And there are countless other examples. Young Davidson, when I was at Arico Gold, is another underground variant of sort of going to an old mine and, again, looking at bigger, broader soaps and higher tonnage operations. So there's there's tons of examples of this. You, know, you find an old mine you know, where, where the old mine once stood or in the shadow thereof. And in our case, our footprint has 50 past producing mines. Some of them were pretty tiny. 
But yeah, you're right, uh, Israel. We're talking about a, a camp here that has a rich history, but a rich history that hasn't really been uh, explored for, for decades. Well, along with that rich history, you also benefit from over $100 million in existing infrastructure. Can you talk about that a bit, Trent? Yeah, a key, a key asset that we've started to zero in on, um, in addition to the mining claims and, and the fact that we're we're in a camp, we're not that far north, so we've got roads and power and and, and, and qualified uh, skills uh, right, in our, right in our backyard. But with this transaction that, that, that we pulled off, we also got our hands on the only permitted refinery in North America that can process uh, or can, can capable of producing cobalt battery materials. And that's, that's significant because the mineralization you see in North America, the cobalt mineralization, is associated typically with high, high arsenic content. And that high arsenic uh, is, is a problem for the refineries in Asia. They're not accustomed to dealing with it. And it's not, a, it's not a re- necessarily a problem getting rid of it, but it's a permitting issue when you want to go and build a facility that can extract the cobalt from these kinds of ores. Right. And having the only facility permitted, ready to go, that can do that puts us in a really good position. You certainly don't need three of these things in the camp. You only need one and probably one over a larger, over a larger footprint. And it just sets us up to be a, a go-to company for not just for our own material, but for any other feed that might be identified in, in Canada and potentially the U.S. Now, you recently added to that land position, an already impressive land position, and you also recently announced, I believe it was a $25 million financing. Can, can you talk about yeah. those two pieces of news, Trent? Yeah, so the financing 25 million U.S. Uh, is uh, you know, more than we're going to spend in the year ahead. But we we had such strong demand around the world, Australia, Hong Kong, and, and the Americas, Europe. Um, we thought that it was the right time to you know, replenish the treasury and get ourselves in a good position to to execute. So now that we've got that money, we're going to drill. We'll have our drill plans out next week, but we're going to it'll be a you know, three, four, five fold increase over what we did last year in the camp. Now that we've identified targets and kind of felt our way around, built the team. Uh, this is going to be the year where we drill multiple targets uh, simultaneously and, and really get a handle on where we want to focus our energies. Uh, so the capital is going to be helpful in that regard. But we're also at a point as the biggest cobalt explorer in the world. We're well positioned now to go out and, and look for, for partners or look for other acquisitions and opportunities outside of our camp, You know, starting probably with Canada and the U.S. and uh, and, and see how we continue to diversify and get exposure to some of the best assets in the world. We've got one that we think is phenomenal, but we're not going to stop there. I think the market wants to see us bulk up, and uh, and we've been given the license to go and do so. Great. So you're cashed up. You'll be drilling. I'm excited to hear the details of the drilling. I also understand that you're doing some sampling on past waste material for metallurgical work. How is that coming along, and, and what's the thought process behind that? Yeah, we've got two parallel programs. On the one hand, we've got the exploration program, which was modest last year. It was a million and a half dollars. We've identified some new cobalt veins, and we're starting to get a, an understanding for what's going on underground, uh, and more to come on that. But the uh, program you're referring to is is headed up by our VP of BizDev, uh, Peter Campbell, who is our, our engineer. And, and that is really good. It started out with just sampling old historic, we call them waste piles, now we call them muck piles. When they mine these deposits, uh, you know, in the, in the old days, um, anything that wasn't, you know, these, these carbonate vein material was, was brought to surface, get it out of the way, the hanging wall and the foot wall material, as we call it. And it was just, it was left as waste on the side of these, uh, these underground, these shafts. And we've gone through and sampled them with the view that, you know, we know from the gold world, you don't go from high grade mineralization to zero in the host rock. And so we started sampling a bunch of those. And sure enough, we're getting some very interesting grades, not just of cobalt, but also silver, some nickel, some, some copper, some zinc. Um, so a very interesting set of polymetallic uh, uh, I guess context that we're working in, and it's not it's not the same throughout the camp. There's different contexts that we're working in, and so now having having done all that and seeing the grades, Peter is overseeing a program of sampling, uh, you know, many tons of these materials to try to get a feel for you know, a dozen or so of these stockpiles, what the average grade would be. So our geologists went and picked the high grade stuff, sampled it. And what's the average grade? And if the average grade is sufficient across all the metals and the flow sheet works, could we find ourselves in an early cash flow situation by producing or uh, producing a, a concentrate out of these muck piles across the camp over the next year or two. So, you know, stay tuned on that. I think once we get the muck pile sample results done, we'll want to do an economic analysis and try to uh, try to validate, you know, the existence of a business plan to keep going on that. Well, I think shareholders will be well served to look forward to that. I heard you say recently, Trent, that it was great to finally be a part of a cool metal. 
<laughs> and, and obviously you're ahead of a mega trend here. Tell me a bit, just could you provide some macro insight? Because you're obviously having a lot of behind the scenes conversations with players in the industry, both people that are looking for supply and then you yourself mentioned that you may be looking at potential acquisitions if the right opportunity presented itself. What are you hearing? What does it feel like to be involved with not just the cool metal, but clearly, clearly what's what's early days of a mega trend? It is, no, it is a mega trend. And so the you know the, the cool the cool factor is you're you're not one of a thousand gold companies out there. <laughs> you're one of sort of investable cobalt players. You're one of depending on your threshold four to four to ten players. And so automatically you, you kind of stand out from the crowd when you're looking for a vehicle that you know the name comes up. Um, but the, the mega trend that you refer to is is it's an it's a, it's a true revolution in mobility. We've got a one percent penetration rate of electric vehicles specifically going on in the world right now, and we're just starting. And I think most people would would agree that we're at a point of no return. So pick pick your penetration rate. Whether we're going to go at 10% in the next five years or 20, or whether we go to 35% in in, in 15 years, it, it doesn't doesn't really matter. The, the reality is we're we're at a point where lithium ion batteries, and now I'm including laptops and phones as well as uh, vehicles and scooters and what have you, buses. Uh, that's 50% of the cobalt supply today. So you double the penetration rate overnight. There, there just is not enough cobalt on the planet to satiate that. So players like us are out there trying to, and there, like, be, there is going to be discoveries. So I think we will find a way to, 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 to fill that gap. But over the next five years, it's going to be a really interesting, um, interesting space to watch as the miners play catch up with consumer demand, with millennials, with Chinese regulators trying to clean up their, their atmosphere, um, with the Tesla movement and so on and so forth. Uh, we haven't even t- looked really, uh, mm. myself, and also the analysts at what the impact might be from things like uh, grid storage and the power wall and all the other ideas out there. So lots and lots coming. We can't, I can't wrap my head around projections because frankly, they, they just turn out to be wrong. The revisions that we've seen this year are all upward. And every auto company on the planet has done a massive shift of their R&D away from diesel completely and increasingly away from the combustion engine in favor of electric vehicles. And I don't think most of the world, particularly in North America, where we're laggards in, in the adoption side, I don't think most of us really appreciate what the world is going to look like in, in 10 years, let alone five. Agreed. Agreed. Now, you mentioned, you touched on this a bit earlier. You said that most of the cobalt is processed in Asia and, and that the majority is mined in the DRC. How important is it for you or was it for you to have this dominating jurisdictional advantage? Yeah, we actually started out by looking at the Congo. You know, that's, that's where 60% of the production is coming from today. So, you know, we thought, let's go to elephant country to go looking for cobalt. But the reality is the world... The world wants cobalt that's not in the DRC. And, and so you've got a situation right now where the majority is being mined in the Congo and the majority of the battery materials is being uh, refined out of China. And, and the problem that creates is you've got the political instability in the DRC, but you've also got this overlay of child labor and, and human rights violations in the Congo. So consumer groups have put pressures on the, on the likes of Tesla and Apple and Samsung to, to source clean cobalt. And so now anytime you're getting cobalt out of China, which is 80% of refined cobalt, um, you, you've got to be able to certify your supply chain. And so as a result, it's created a lot of interest in what we're doing in North America, uh, both from the, the, end, uh, the end users, the buyers, as well as intermediaries, whether they be uh, you know, refiners. And even some of the lithium and diversified miners have started to pay attention to what we're doing because people identify that we've got something that's pretty unique. And just to be clear, there's nobody in, there's not anybody in North America that's got the infrastructure, <laughs> the refinery, and then and the exploration upside, frankly, that, that you possess. Is that correct? Yeah, certainly. I would say when it comes to the uh, the refinery, we're, we're unique. And, and the exploration upside, likewise, we've got a massive land package here, and it makes us pretty special. There are other cobalt uh, you know, exploration development plays out there, but I think we've got a couple of attributes that are going in our favor here. And, and as I said, we, this company is nine or ten months old, effectively. So kind of watch out. We've got a lot to come. And again, we've got a heck of a team, and we only strengthened the team once we completed this merger. Uh, Paul Matissic came on as chairman of the board. Bob Cross came in. And, and that sends a good a good message to the market. We've got a management team that knows how to build and operate mines, and we've got a board that's capital markets friendly. And, and frankly, they won't stand in the way of a transaction at the right time if somebody wanted to buy us out. So, you know, as an investor, you should you should feel comfortable that this team can execute, or or get out of the way if somebody bigger wants to come and do it for us. Excellent. Now we talked about the financing. We touched on it a bit. What does the cash position look like? You mentioned not having to dilute anytime soon. What does the updated cash position and share structure look like right now, Trent? Yeah, we raised uh, we raised uh, about twenty five million US, as you, as you mentioned. And and by the time the transaction was done and our exploration plans for the year, we were we were, were completed. We were we were getting we were getting down to the last million or so. So that's 
probably where we stand right now. Um, our budget this year probably won't be more than half of that. I and mean, I say that with a, with a little bit of caution, because with a little bit of success, we might just ramp things up even further. But ostensibly, we've got enough cash for the next uh, the next two years. And if we need to spend this faster, well, then it's good news because it means we're on to something that we think is, uh, is worth pursuing. Absolutely. Trent, I want to thank you for your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think, I think this is, uh, these are happy days for us. We're, uh, we feel fortunate to be where we are. The market is hot. I think uh, this is a, certainly a space to watch, not just in 2017 where it was the top performing metal, but um, there, there's, there's no signs of letting up into 2018. So Cobalt, I think, will continue to be in the headlines in the year ahead. Well, as you check off milestones, I'm looking forward to having you back on to update everybody. Trent, thank you again. As am I. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.